All right, Philippians chapter 2, and we're probably going to once again sort of make verse 5 of chapter 2 our focus. However, we want to understand what's going on in verses 6 through 11 that give verse 5 its power. And yet we also want to be mindful of the broader context here. We're into the core of Philippians where Paul really comes to his most important points in this letter starting with verse 27 of chapter 1. So if you bear with me and read along with me, we'll start in verse 27 of chapter 1 as we did last week and read through verse 18 of chapter 2. Paul says, he's writing to the Philippians, a, a church that was beloved by him and a church that loved him. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Remember, this is the man who said just a few verses earlier, for me to live is Christ. And he wants their lives to be like that. This is a church that he knows is a faithful church. They're going through some issues together. Perhaps some persecution is taking place. We know that conflict is taking place within their own congregation. But he says, we have to put Christ first. My life is Christ. Your conduct must be worthy of Christ. And the only way for your conduct to be worthy of the Christ is if your life is Christ as well. So this is a people that I believe, as Paul writes to them, he, he believes that they have his same motivation, that what motivates him to serve the Lord also motivates them. He loves Christ, and he knows they love Christ. And so let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. He knows that this is their common aim, their common goal, but sometimes, even though we profess Christ, and he is our goal, he is our aim, yet in the practical daily affairs of our life, when the world is coming against us, and perhaps within the congregation of the body of Christ's saints, there's some conflict amongst us, it can be difficult to keep that prize, that aim in mind. But we must let our conduct, they are called to let their conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So, that whether I come and see you, or I am absent from you, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast. And how will you stand fast? In one spirit, with one mind, striving together rather than striving against each other. I think that's no accident of, of a rhetorical use there of, of this word striving. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. He'll mention some uh, issues later. He'll name some saints by name who are having a conflict. But you need to be unified. You're not going to survive the conflicts from the outside. And you're not going to survive the conflicts from the inside unless you're focused on Christ and you're unified by his spirit in the faith of his gospel. And he goes on. And you should not be in any way terrified by your enemies, by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of your salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, God has given you that, he has granted you saving faith, he has opened your eyes by his spirit to see the Christ and to believe on him, but that's not it. That's not all. He has also granted you to be able to suffer for his sake. To suffer. To suffer at the hands of the world. And sometimes, as he'll point out, to suffer at the hands of brothers and sisters. We have suffering in this world. Sometimes from without. Sometimes from within. God has granted you to believe in his son. But he has also granted you that you might be able to add some gems to your crown to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, then fulfill my joy 
by being like-minded, by having the same love, by being of one accord, by having one mind. Don't let anything be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness, in lowliness, in lowliness. That's, that's us getting low before the Lord, before the Master, before our King. We're getting low. We have a low mind, a, a low esteem of ourselves because Jesus is all that matters and lifting Him up is our aim and our goal. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others. Now, keep this in mind. We, we railed on it last week. I'm going to rail on it again this week. This is contrary to the philosophy of the world. The world says, you must, Michael, you must love yourself first, foremost. You must have time for yourself. You must edify yourself. You must think about yourself. You must love and nurture and take care of yourself or else you will never be able to love others. The Bible confronts that. The New Testament conflicts with that. It says the world is wrong. You must, you must esteem others not equal to you. Okay. If the world wanted to sneak in here, they might say, well, 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 as long as you esteem others equal. Equality. We're all equal. Now, there's a place for that at the cross of Christ, of course. But as it relates to our own pride, we put that down. We have lowliness of mind. We have humility before the Christ, before the cross. That way we can have humility before our brothers and sisters and before the world. We have humility, and so we don't esteem others equal to us. We esteem others above us. We esteem others better, 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 better. That person that I mm, don't like them, don't like what they do, don't like how they treat me, but before Christ, I must esteem them better than me. They are better than me. Well, well, we're going to rail on that a little bit later, but keep that in mind. Better than himself or herself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Notice the scripture again. I think Jesus even says, well, you already love yourself. <laughs> I don't have to tell people to love themselves. The world says you really have to work on yourself and work on loving yourself. The Bible says you do love yourself. You need to start loving others. And the only way you're going to do that is if you love Christ first. He's your life. And then you have the love of Christ in you so you can love others. And instead of looking out just for your own interest, because of course you're going to do that, you start looking out for the interest of others. Those people that you think, you know what? That despicable saint is better than me. <laughs> They're better than me. They're better than me. And I need to make sure that, that they're taken care of. Instead of saying, well, they wouldn't worry about me. Instead of projecting into them what you assume they think because they're such a rotten person. We'll come back to that. Let's keep reading. Let's get this context here. So let this mind be in you. Some scholars argue it should be translated among you. The, the mind in the body of the saints that should be among us the way we think should be the way of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be among your congregation, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay. Paul has said some nasty things. We don't want to admit they're nasty. Esteeming that brother and sister that bothers you, that brother and sister that confronts you, that conflicts with you, that they're better than you. Looking out for their interests rather than your own. These are difficult things. Let's not be holier than thou and pretend, oh yeah, this is of course the Christ life. Oh yeah, that's how I act. That's how I behave. I'm always putting those people that bother me way above myself. So Paul knows this is heavy stuff. 
It's a heavy dose of humility that we don't want. So he says, let's look to Christ. Let's look to Christ. Let's examine this mind that we're supposed to have within us and among us. He was in the form of God, but he didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. And there's arguments exactly on what the interpretation is, the traditional one that you've heard, of course. He didn't think he had to hold on to the prerogatives of godhood. He reckoned that it was worthy to obey his father and to condescend and to put his prerogatives, his powers of being God, his privileges, if you will, of being the king of the universe, to disrobe himself, to put those prerogatives, those privileges, those powers, put those on the shelf. To, to take off that majesty, to put on humility. He didn't think that was a big deal. <laughs> we sure do. You want me to do what? For you? For them? But Jesus said, I can do this. This is the Father's will. And that's all that matters to me. Just like Paul initially said, for me to live is Christ. That's all that matters. And so everything filters down from that. Our conduct should be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Everything else should filter down from that. So Jesus, he was willing to disrobe himself of, if we put it in our shoes, disrobe himself of his, of his pride, of his majesty, of the things that make him high, of the things that make him exalted. He was willing to say, I can be humiliated instead. But he made himself of no reputation. He, he emptied himself of all of those wonderful things, those things that make him the master of the universe. And he took the form of a slave. Servant is probably a little too comfortable there. The master of the universe made himself the slave of all. The slave. Think about a slave. They don't have their own rights. They don't have their own privileges. All they have is what's given to them. That's it. They are owned by another. Their will is not their own. And the one who has the sovereign will of the universe said, I will subject my sovereign will to my father. And I will subject myself to the humiliation of men and I will become a slave. I will be the one who has no place to lay his head. And he came, he sure did, in the likeness of men, the incarnation, the greatest miracle and mystery of all time, that God would do this to himself, that the Son of God, that God the Son, would disrobe himself and take on flesh. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. Okay, how obedient? To death. Wait, what is Christianity expecting of me? What is God expecting of me? He's expecting death. For Jesus, it was physical death. For some Christians, it's physical death. But mark this, it is always death. To take up your cross and follow him is to deny yourself, is to reckon yourself dead. And this new life you have in Christ is a life of following the Christ, of being his slave, of doing what he wishes. For you are not your own any longer. You have been bought with the price of the precious blood of Christ. So to the point of death, even the death of the cross, the most humiliating, the most excruciating. The word excruciating comes from the word for cross. The most humiliating, the most excruciating form of death. Therefore, because Jesus disrobed himself, because he didn't hold on to all his powers and privileges, because he humbled himself, because he was obedient even to death and even to death on a cross, the Father, his answer to him, it was to highly exalt him. 
and to give him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus, Messiah, is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So he gives them this incredible example of humility. The king bowing himself low. The king girding himself with a towel as a slave. The king obedient even to death, not just any death, but the most humiliating of death. The king willing to endure a life of humiliation. We have spoken during the Christmas season of the humiliation of Christ in his birth. Yes, angels sang, but I suggest to you, Mary and Joseph's family were not rejoicing. That that couple thanked the Lord that he sought to bring them strangers and shepherds to rejoice with them, for nobody else will, for this illegitimate child that's born and laid in a manger, the shame of a family, the shame of a family. The master of the universe, the Lord on high, says, I will be humiliated from birth to death. I will be ashamed at my birth. I will cause my mother great grief. I will cause my father embarrassment, Joseph. I will be ashamed from my birth. I will scandalize people with my preaching. And I will hang shamefully, nakedly on the cross because my father wills it to be. My father wills it. My father wills it. I might pray. I've lived a life of humility. I've lived a life of humiliation. I've been the shame of my family since my birth. My brothers and sisters disdain me. They think I'm a lunatic. Apparently they didn't believe their own parents' story. They knew the truth, the worldly truth of the oldest son, the illegitimate one. Mom and dad had him before they were married. Grandma and grandpa don't like him. The shame of the family, the scandalous preacher. He drinks too much. You see him out there with the winos and the tax collectors. He calls himself a rabbi. How dare he associate with those filthy people out there. Scandalous. A man of humiliation from birth through life and then at death. Though he had committed no crime against Rome, they stripped him, they beat him, and they hung him up on that cross and they mocked him and spit at him. While his mother once, once more wept. No doubt she wept at his birth. Wept that her parents shunned her, shunned him. Now she weeps that everybody seems to shun this shameful son of Mary. Why is it so difficult for us to follow Christ in humiliation? Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not, in my, not as in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Let this be something serious and sober-minded, something that you take up with great devotion. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring, without disputing and fighting. He's going to address that later. I keep saying it. We'll eventually get there. That you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain, Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice in me. 
One day, Paul says, I'll stand before the Christ on his day. You will too. We'll stand before the humiliated one who is now the exalted one. And we who have been humiliated with him for his sake, we will be exalted with him and by him. And so it is important that we have his mind in us, his mind among us, a mind of humility, a mind that is worth, that is willing to endure humiliation. It is humiliating to say to somebody that you despise, you're better than me. It, it, it grates against our pride. It grates against our very nature to look at somebody who disagrees with us, who's in conflict with us, and say, they're better than me, and let me watch out for their interests. Now, let me back up just a second. We're talking here specifically about the body of Christ. And last week we emphasized, we are talking about people who are orthodox believers in Christ. Those who believe in the Apostles' Creed, Christians, part of the true church of God. But we noted last week through some examples that even in the Orthodox Church, and not the Greek Orthodox Church, but the, the church that serves the Lord, the true church of Christ throughout the world, that within each congregation there can be difficulties, and sometimes cross con congregations there can be conflicts. And we need to be careful. We have a testimony to watch out for. And we need to be careful that we are not aggravating people or being aggravated by people who come to different conclusions as they honestly interpret Scripture. They come to certain convictions that we say, well, I don't know about that. That seems wrong to me. And they look over at us, well, I don't know about that. How'd you come to that? I mean, isn't it amazing, really, how two honest, God-fearing, Christ-honoring Christians who sincerely want to read the Scripture and interpret it to the best of their ability so that they might apply it to their lives and run their churches accordingly, that we can come to very different conclusions on certain things. And we can look at the other and say, I don't know how you get that. They, sh they show you their texts. They show you their interpretation, and it just boggles the mind. I, I don't follow how you can interpret it that way. And then they look at you, and they hear your interpretation. They see your understanding, and they say, I really don't see how you could twist the scripture like that and come to that conclusion. And so, in the church, if you've been a Christian very long, you know that in the church, there can be serious conflict, congregation splitting conflict that can destroy a congregation, that can divide the body of Christ. We must be careful of this because, as Paul said, our conduct is to be worthy of the gospel of Christ. What did Jesus say about his disciples, about you and me? By your love, one for another, not just your love for yourself, we already know you love yourself, but by your love for everybody else within the body, the world will look on and they will know. Well, those must be disciples of Jesus because only he was able to conduct himself like that. Only he was able to love like that. So these people who come together as a body, as a unity, as a congregation, diverse as they might be, and especially if you go back to the the primitive church, the first generation church, you got Jews and Gentiles coming together, lots of difficulties with that. Difficulties that I'm afraid we underestimate, that we no longer really understand how difficult was the cultural conflict. But they come together. And Jesus says, if you could just love each other now as you've come together, all of this diversity melding into one body of Christ, the world will look on and be impressed by that. The world will look on and know that you're mine. But how do we do this? How can we have this kind of humility? Well, what if? What if? Well, let's think about humility. Let's think about humiliation. 
How can I humiliate myself to such a degree that I can love that person, that I can esteem them better than myself, and that I can look out for their interests? So that, by my very conduct, the gospel might be glorified and well adorned in love and grace. Well, what if the next time I find a person I disagree with, maybe there's a doctrine they're off on. Now remember, we're still within orthodoxy, but within orthodoxy there is, some, there is a, a prism of belief and doctrinal differences. I think we're all aware of that. I could go into a church today and if the pastor invited me to speak and I open up my Bible and somebody notices, wait a minute, he's not reading from the King James Version. Is that the new king? Stone that man, right? So by the littlest thing, some are more important than others, but I might look at that as not important. The man who, who calls attention to it, to him, it's like life and death. This is of the utmost importance. So sometimes don't, don't think that just because you think, well, that's not such an important thing, I can get along with it. The other person might think it's life and death. It's like the most important thing. So we have to realize, okay, let's put on our humility. Let's be humiliated and say, okay, here's how I'm going to do it. This person, I'm going to treat them as if they are right and I am wrong. Now, if you really think you're right and they're wrong, that's why it's called humility. That's why it really will feel humiliating to do it. But this is what it means to treat others better than yourself. I'm going to treat them like they're right, like they're better than me, and I'm wrong, and I'm not as good as they are. That's humility. I, I have said it before. The church buys in to the world's idea of humility. When we think of humility, what we think of is that person is so humble. And what we mean is they're so down to earth. They're so kind. They're so generous. That is not humility. It's kindness and generosity. But it's not humility. According to scripture, as we are reading it here, for us to understand humility and humiliation, it's to understand the life of a slave. Somebody who does not have the prerogative of exercising their own will. Humility is the life of a slave who has been purchased and bought. His dignity depends on the dignity of his master. Luckily, we have a very kind master. And we are dignified by who has purchased us. But once again, a slave doesn't have rights and privileges. He doesn't have a voice. Today in the world, you keep hearing that, the term voice. You have to have your voice. You have to find your voice. And the Bible says, shut your mouth. Let them only hear the voice of God through you. Let them not hear your voice, your thoughts, your opinions. And so the slave simply bows to the one before them. For the slave, it doesn't matter if they like them or not. They are serving the master. And so whoever is before them, they simply must serve them. And the slave assumes everybody's better than him. Everybody is higher. The slave knows I have to look out for everybody's interest because that's what my master expects. And some slaves were named stewards. Some slaves were held responsible for the household. Jesus calls his slaves and says, I want you to be stewards. He looks at his people, his mass of slaves. I want to give you great responsibility. And do you know there's only one single thing asked for and required of a steward? 
that he, that she be found faithful. So when they come into confrontation, it's the master they represent. And they treat that person who has confronted them. They treat that person who is attacking them as if they're right and the servant is wrong. And they bow. And they love. How can I take care of your interests? Yes, you must be right. What does a lowly servant know? What does such a slave as I know next to you? You're so much better than me. You're so much higher than me. How can I serve you? How many conflicts in my life? How many conflicts in your life? How many conflicts in every church we've, any of us have ever been a part of would immediately disappear if Jesus had more slaves in the midst? If Jesus had more people who, against the very nature of their sinful pride, said, I shall be humiliated with Christ. And I will humiliate myself before people. And I will treat them like they are better than me and like they are right, as if I am wrong. Now, secretly, Jesus knows you may think you're quite right. But Jesus looks at the heart and he sees the actions and he says, look at that slave. My servant, he wants to tell that person off right now. He wants to take him to scripture and show them why they're wrong. He just wants to let it out and put that person in their place. Because I haven't said here that the person is right, that they are better than us but simply that we are treating them that way. And no doubt Jesus is looking, and he's like, man, that person really is wrong. How's Michael going to respond here? He's treating them as if they're right. He's humbling himself. He is demonstrating humiliation of his pride. Hopefully I'll get there. Hopefully we're striving to be there. But how many conflicts in life and in church would truly dissolve in the love of Christ if we said, okay, for us to live is Christ. And our conduct must be worthy of his gospel. And if Jesus was willing to disrobe himself and shame himself, <sighs> wow. Am I better than Jesus? I'm not willing to disrobe myself of my pride. I'm not willing to get rhetorically spit on. And maybe, as the pastor knows, he's been persecuted for the gospel a few times, maybe physically treated wrong. But that's another sermon dealing with the world. I'm trying here to focus on brothers and sisters in Christ, the body of Christ, that so often does not get along. And what do we do? Now, in closing, I'll just bring up one issue that we must confront in our day and age. What about the Christian who is compromising the scripture, compromising the gospel. What about the church that hangs up the rainbow flag? Well, I think the answer here is, what was our in initial qualification? We are talking about people who truly profess Christ, who truly lift up the scripture, like we said last week, who are honestly attempting to interpret scripture that they might live by it. I suggest to you that those Christians that disgrace themselves by compromising with the world's philosophies and ways that hang up the flags and do all of that, I would place them outside of the bounds of the body. I would place them outside the bounds of the body. Where it gets tricky the world doesn't see that imaginary line. And we must be careful and gracious while we are honest and truthful. In fact, I think the Bible says that. Speak the truth in love. And I think we have to be able to confront those who are outside the body, who are shaming the word of God, and who are bringing shame to our master. And so there is a place where we do tell the truth. 
And so I, I don't want us to imagine that humility means compromise. It does not. We are talking about true brothers and sisters in true churches of God who are truly attempting to live their lives and govern their churches by the scripture. And within those bounds, where we disagree, where we have conflict, we need to be humble and show that humiliation. The other thing is worth a different kind of sermon. It is something, though, that we should be thinking about. How do we confront the mixed messages of the church today in the Western world? And that is something worth thinking of because that's really the problem. For, and it's not just those who put up the colorful flags. It's all of these pastors and evangelists and so-called Christian ministries and so-called Christian charities that are just daily falling through scandal, embarrassing Christ through scandal. There, all of this needs an answer from the true and sincere slaves of Christ. And I, we need to be careful and cautious how we approach these things. Because here's what's most important, that they don't hear our voice, but that they hear the voice of Christ. How many times have you been disappointed, maybe every time, when a, a favored TV preacher goes on, the, the, it used to be Larry King, I think he passed away a few years ago, but he goes on TV to have an interview, and he just compromises the gospel left and right. It, where there's, there's just no gospel left, right? That's because they're ashamed of the voice of Christ, and they want their voice not to be seen as offensive. And so we have to be willing to allow our voice to just subside into the quiet and simply rely on and put the scripture, God's voice, the voice of Christ out there. Well, this is what the Bible says. And we don't have to be afraid to say, I know it's difficult. I know it's hard. I, I'm, I'm like the disciples, right? Jesus says hard sayings. And I say, they're hard sayings, but where else can we go? He has the words of life. If we can make that our answer, I think the world will respect it more than if they get confused by the voice of Michael or the voice of some other saint. Let's not be so anxious to make sure we have the right answers. There's only one right answer, and it's this. It's the voice of God by his spirit through his word. These are difficult things, so let us pray that the Lord might help us in all of them.